right, welcome folks. We're here to talk about uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, or actually former Sheriff Joe Arpaio, uh, the recent pardon that uh, Donald Trump gave to him, and the limits of the pardon power. And, I, and I'm joined here by two people who know uh, a lot about both things. My name is Randy Parras. I'm former president and founder of Citizens for Better Arizona. Um, I came from California. I started organizing, um, organizing residential workers, primarily Latino residential workers, uh, uh, immigrant workers. And we started getting reports back in 07, 08, where they were being more fearful because they felt they were being targeted and the sheriffs were coming out to round them up, right? And so we started looking into the situation. And so we found out that, you know, it wasn't just targeting those, it was just brown people in general. He, he was feeding on the anti-immigrant frenzy that was going on across America, and he was benefiting from it, right? So I started engaging, and we started to engage the Board of Supervisors, right, because they oversee his budget. They could cut his budget at any time. He had a budget of about $300 million. And so it's through that type of political activism that we started to engage them. He got a reaction from him. Eventually he targeted me. He had me arrested for public you know, so the, um, and disorderly conduct and criminal trespass, which are totally trumped up charges, forced me to go to court, had to go to court and present my case, which would have cost me out of pocket $50,000, but I had pro bono representation that protected me, right? And of course the judge threw it out, but this is what he did, not just to me, but other people before I got there. There was a real, there's, you could feel the fear in that county about he was able to do what he wanted when he wanted, and there was no repercussions. And to, to put this in context, in, in the mid-2000s, the Republican Party had a significant element of it that wanted to do Im immigration reform, mostly funded by the business wing. Was it your sense that the bubbling up of the nativism was greater after the Chamber of Commerce and Bush tried to push forward with reform? Yeah, it's sure, the real faction within the Republican Party, we had these nativists that am amnesty you know, over their dead body. They weren't going to have any type of reform. Um, under their watch. So the Tea Party was very powerful in Arizona. And Russell Pierce, who became the author of SB 1070 and was a close ally of Sheriff Rapile, he was, he was the Tea Party president in Arizona. And it was a lot of strategy going on between those two, between Pierce and Sheriff Rapile, to make sure they had a place to put these folks when they brought them in. What, what kinds of things would get you arrested? We had, in, our, in, the, in the work that we did, we had people arrested for clapping at a board supervisor's meeting. We had people that were arrested for, for standing up and be, after they've been asked to leave out in front. The captain of the bomb and SWAT squad division, Captain Letourneau, came to my press conference the next day after I was released in shades and a leather jacket. We didn't know who he was, but that's who he was. He was assigned to have follow, get intelligence on me. And so it was really impressive. He, he arrested elected officials who spoke out against him. He arrested a judge. He went after judges as well, Superior Court Judge Barbara Mandrell. Uh, he went after county supervisor, the only Democrat on there, um, Mary Rose Wilcox. So it resulted in almost a million dollar payout when she went to court. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of payouts, right, that, the, that, that was going because of his, his conduct. And so eventually, by 2016, the voters actually, you know, got rid of him to make sure to, to, to kind of make that right. But these are the types of things he was doing consistently. In addition to racial profiling, he'd go after his enemies, you know. People have a pretty good idea of what racial profiling is nationally. Uh, but how, how different and how extreme was it in, uh, in Maricopa County? It was basically the extent, it was so bad that the mayor of Phoenix at that time wrote a letter to the Department of Justice because his, his own staff members were getting pulled over because of the color of their skin. After they're out in the park coming home with their children being questioned about where's your driver, what's your, what nationality, they're asking these questions and these are all U.S. citizens, right? It got so extreme that they would just cast a net and go after different folks and regardless, and people would sit there waiting because they didn't have ID on them. They were, they were legal residents, they had work permits, but yet they were detained as well. And so it, it just went, it just kept going and going and going just for this notion so you could create the fear he wanted um, to go after undo, uh, illegal, Im undocumented immigrants and, and to appeal to his base, which was the Tea Party. So President Trump on Friday night, uh, he said because there were such high ratings for the storm, he decided that that's when he was going to announce a full pardon, not a commutation, a full pardon uh, for uh, Sheriff Joe, and said something about a future pardon almost as well. Um, but it, it turns out that there may be limits to the pardon power, and Trump may have pushed it beyond that limit. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Right. I'm John Bonifaz, president of Free Speech for People, and we issued a letter this past Tuesday with Protect Democracy to the U.S. Justice Department urging that it actually oppose Sheriff Joe Arpaio's motion, now pending before the federal court in Phoenix, to vacate his conviction. And the reason why we're urging this is because the pardon, in our view, is unconstitutional. The pardon power is not absolute. It is limited by subsequent amendments to the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights. And in the Bill of Rights, we know there's the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, uh, which is specifically being violated by Arpaio in the underlying case where he was found to be in criminal contempt. He was violating the due process rights of all of those people he was illegally detaining, putting in the tent city and everywhere else. So 
if we're going to have a system of rule of law and a constitution that's going to be upheld and applied equally to all, then we cannot engage in having a president abuse the pardon power to trample on people's constitutional rights. And that's what's really at stake here. And, and when the federal judge on October 4th has argument on this question of whether or not to vacate the conviction, this question of whether or not the pardon power was abused is also going to be raised. Trump's pardon is basically just overturning democracy in the third branch of government. You had a federal judge that was appointed by George W. Bush, right, Judge um, Murray Snow, who, who initially found him guilty of racially profiling after looking at all the evidence, right, took his time to liberate. This was a Republican judge, looked at the evidence, saw objectively ruled, and then, and then you had another federal judge come in and say, this, after he was given the directive, right, was a clear violation of that, you know, publicly making statements that he's not going to apply to him, he's going to do what he wants to do because that's what he's done before. And so when the third branch of government functions appropriately, now you have the executive branch coming in because of a political ally in favor to circumvent that process. So this is this is the fundamentals of democracy that's being threatened at this point. Is the is the difference that he's a government official that w would make it unconstitutional? Well, the fact is, is that in terms of the violation of the constitutional rights, it has to come from the government, except for the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolishes slavery, which even private citizens can be prosecuted under. But yes, he was a law enforcement official. This sends a message to law enforcement officials all over the country who would dare do what Arpaio does in terms of racial profiling, in terms of violating people's constitutional rights, that they now can be immunized from any kind of conviction that might come forward. And, it, and as Randy says, it's not only the underlying conviction here because he refused to comply with the court order telling him to stop the violation of the constitutional rights he was then found in civil contempt and when he refused to violate when he refused to comply with that order by uh, judge snow then that judge referred the matter to another judge to decide whether or not he was to be in criminal contempt and it's the criminal contempt conviction that was to enforce the underlying orders and that's what he was pardoned for and just to underline what you said earlier this isn't over the the judge was asked to dismiss as you said I want, I want people to understand this the, the judge was asked to vacate Sheriff Joe's conviction based on the pardon and the judge said no I mean the judge didn't say I'm not going to do it but the judge said I want to hear arguments uh, from from both sides of for asked, why I should have to do this. And ask for full briefing from right. both sides. So yes, this matter is going to be continued in that courtroom and perhaps in another courtroom because the underlying constitutional rights that have been violated are at stake here. And it's a threat to our republic and our constitution to have a president abuse the pardon power like this. What about the pardon of Richard Nixon? Let's take that as an example. Yes. Uh, one of the impeachment articles had, was about bombing Cambodia. Um, so that's the the right of Congress to wait, you know, to declare war. So let's say that Nixon was violating people's constitutional rights. Was Ford within his rights to, to pardon Nixon? Now, nobody challenged him, so... Well, actually, there were two cases that went before the federal district courts, <laughs> and both of them were dismissed for failure to state a claim. But it is actually uh, important to draw the distinction here, because as much as that pardoned was objectionable, in my view, and that shouldn't have happened, there were no underlying constitutional claims that could be made. I mean, the bombing of Cambodia, as much as we'd like to try to draw a constitutional argument there, I, I, don't, I don't see what that is. Here you have a law enforcement official who was day in and day out for years violating the due process rights of people all across Maricopa County solely based on the color of their skin. And I think that's the test here. And furthermore, you know, this president has signaled uh, through his aides and through reports that he's looking at the pardon power for himself and for mm -hmm. his own associates with respect to the pending Russian investigation. So this is a very critical moment in our history where we have to test the limits of this pardon power and have a court decide whether or not the president is like a king, able to pardon anyone he wishes, including himself. Has any uh, pardon ever been thrown out or challenged in this or successfully challenged in this way? The, the only issue that's come before the U.S. Supreme Court was back in 1925. It dealt with an individual who was violating the Prohibition Act um, and it was found in criminal contempt and the president had pardoned him. Again, there were no underlying constitutional rights at stake. This is unprecedented and it's an extraordinary uh, matter for the, for the country and for the courts, but it has to be addressed because if this president gets away with pardoning Joe Arpaio, then all of our constitutional rights are threatened. If a, if a president wanted to make this kind of pardon and you were his attorney, and obviously Donald Trump does not care about making things legal or, or finding the nuance yes. in a situation, he just does what he does. But yes. let's pretend that there's a president who's like, I want to pardon Sheriff Joe yeah. and I want to make it legal. Yes. 
uh, what can I do? What, what would you advise him beyond, like, let's say you have, like, he's going to do some sort of pardon or commutation. Yes. Like, what could he do within his constitutional power? Not his moral power, but constitutional power. I mean, I think what they're going to argue in court is that they had the basis to do this because of that 1925 ruling when the Supreme Court decided this. But further, you know, the pardon power is usually assigned to the pardon attorney in the U.S. Justice Department. It's removed from the White House. And, and the policy within the Justice Department is to wait five years at least before considering pardons for anybody and demonstrate that the defendant has declared some kind of remorse uh, and accepted the conviction. None of that occurred here. He was literally convicted of criminal contempt only a few weeks ago, and the president was out there can in campaign style making it clear that he stood with Joe Arpaio just like Joe Arpaio stood with him during his campaign. So he laid the groundwork for this clearly to be an example of an abuse of the pardon power. And just to underscore that point, no, he didn't do that. He, in that rally, he also made it clear he did not stand with the Republican senators. And there's a primary coming up. So there's more politics that can be played and that he pardons our pile. Our pile can appeal to the base. He might be able to take out a Jeff Flake, who's very moderate, in a, in a, in a contested Peter primary where the Tea Party is strong. So there's so much more at stake here what's taking place. And so I think these are some of the calculations the president should not be looking at when we're talking about, you know, pardoning anyone. It should be based on what John mentioned about, you know, what's the totality of the case? Has there been any type of, has it any time even been served? And then has the person shown some sort of forgiveness or saying that he did something wrong? No, this is him still saying that he was right. And right now they're saying, the rule of law is in place because he's been pardoned. They flipped yeah. the whole thing on its head. Right. The other politics that are at play here are the politics between the judiciary and, and the executive. Yes. Do you think that Trump has been so dismissive or uh, aggressive towards the judiciary that you may actually see the judiciary make a stand here or not? I think there have to be federal judges that are deeply troubled by what has happened here. I mean, he has gone after federal judges already in many other contexts, including over the Muslim ban being overturned. And during the campaign, during saying, the campaign. We, I can't have this brown judge. Exactly. And so I think in this particular instance, we may see one or more federal judges make clear that they think the president is going beyond his powers. If we don't, does this change the balance of power between the branches? Well, I think what it does is it highlights even more why we also have to put on the table an impeachment investigation. I mean, if this president is going to continue to flout the rule of law, continue to violate the Constitution, then he must be held accountable via the impeachment process. And so you might then see, even if the pardon goes through, future presidents will see, well, there might be a relationship there. I, I, I pushed the pardon power beyond its limits, and I wound up, I wind up getting impeached. Also, I think it's up to regular citizens, too. There should be more of a, of a, of a reaction in Phoenix. That's some consistent thing. We're saying, no, we're not accepting this pardon. This is something that, you know, the, the, the voters chose not to pardon our pile in 2016 when they defeated him. His first defeat, historic, you know, over double-digit loss. They have to come out and say, we're not allowing this to happen because this is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong, and we do believe the federal courts have a role, and they're, they're being deliberative. How, how much time did Trump put in before he made this decision? How much evidence did he look over? Probably none. These judges did years and months and years of going through and to make the right call and do their job. Is there, okay, so he's been pardoned for this particular crime. Let's say the pardon stands. Could prosecutors go back within the statute of limitations and find, and he clearly has committed countless individual crimes. Uh, could they go back and just retry him on a specific crime, say you did this to this person? Well, possibly, although the danger of this pardon is it also includes phrases like he is also absolved from any future crimes arising out of this case. Now, there's no precedent for pardoning somebody for future crimes. So that, that also seems completely beyond his pardon power. But there are other cases that have uh, been filed against Joe Arpaio and that this pardon would not impact. And so it is possible to make that argument in a different context. I think of the message that sends, even Arpaio has been pardoned. If he was to do something again, he would get pardoned again under this president. He's not going to then say, oh, right. I'm not. So it's, it's, just, it's giving someone blanket to do whatever they want. So what, what has been the reaction in Arizona and what has Sheriff Joe's reaction been? Well, I think Jeff Joe, you know, he's, he said he might, you know, he's, he's um, so he has some ambition. He might want to see this as a political opportunity to kind of, you know, retake his name. He think he's always claiming that he has done anything wrong. So he's probably looking at other political things. I, I've seen other groups there hold press conferences to speak out against it. There's been a very emotional outreach, I mean, reaction to this. Um, because people have really felt what happens when you get terror, when you get targeted and terrorized and you know, live in that type of fear. But at the same time, I don't know whether there's anything consistent that's going to be coming back to keep hitting on it. Folks are not preparing for all sorts of fights, right? You got the TPS thing coming up, temporary right. protection status. You got DACA being threatened. So there's a there's a there's a war going on in our community, and people are starting to really. This is another signal saying what side Trump's on, 
and he's chosen to be on our pile side. So Nina Rivera kind of speaks for a number of people who are really concerned about the implications in terms of our racial and culture war. You basically have state-sanctioned state racism. This is what it is. It's racism. You know, people got to be prejudicial towards other people, but racism is when an institution has the power to then act on those particular beliefs to impact other people that they're targeting. And so this happened in Arizona. So that's what, and this is basically, instit it's institutionally sponsored racism. And, and to have, you know, the folks that... The institution is supposed to protect those rights. The county attorney, the board of supervisors, the sheriff, you know, be unwilling to hold one person like the sheriff accountable when those rights are violated. That, that speaks to the core of what we're about. And we have, as citizens, it's up to us to break that science and continue to fight back, to pressure, and to, and to speak up. Because absent that, someone like our pile was able to reign for almost over 20 years, right? So I think that's the challenge we have to do to really take on this type of racism at that level. Really quickly, for people who might not be minorities and aren't especially inclined to sympathize with the rights of minorities, there are people who were not minorities, there are people who are American citizens um, who, were, who have every right to be, have equal protection under the law that have been victimized by the sheriff. It's not just quote unquote illegals, right? Oh, and my, my body was white. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You talk about a tent city, you talk about a place where the, the, the triple degree heat, you're talking about a place where he on himself referred to as a, his words a concentration camp and was proud of that particular fact. When I was in jail for the most of the day, they came back and threw me a bag of food. It was it was green bologna. It was something right. It was so bad I didn't even eat it. And that's just me but one day, even there one day. Other people have to eat that stuff every day, or you gotta go to a vending machine and do it. He it's, it wasn't just it was the pink underwear, it was it was all these things to really, you know, to desecrate people, to make them feel less than for what they're they're already paying for what they did wrong. And so again, it's it's about how did our pile get there? It's because folks from different backgrounds who position the power and authority refuse you know, refuse to take action, stayed silent. So now it's about us, you know, and now we got Trump again trying to intervene in a place where he shouldn't even be pardoned, but for his relationship with with, with with our pile, we cannot just sit back and, and just you know accept it. We gotta we gotta continue to organize and continue to fight back and continue to speak out. Thomas Mosby would like to know, John. Um, if this uh, federal judge says, I am not going to uh, vacate the, the uh, conviction, what happens next? Does the Supreme Court then uh, make the final decision? Yes, this, 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 this will go up. I mean, if the federal judge uh, denies Arpaio's motion to vacate the conviction and, in fact, even rules that the pardon was unconstitutional, they will undoubtedly appeal to the Federal Appeals Court of the Ninth Circuit. And again, the matter will be litigated there and then possibly up to the Supreme Court. We do think this matter needs to get to the Supreme Court. Uh, we do think that the Supreme Court needs to check uh, this president for his abuse of the pardon power. Rights are supposed to mean something. They're supposed to be protected. And so this is just, you know, the reason why this is so emotional for so many people because at a time when the, when the system finally did catch up, when the voters finally did get rid of him, when the federal court finally did issue a decision that spoke to his guilt, him being guilty, racially profiled, and being in contempt, um, when the federal monitor was put in place to, to make sure he didn't do it anymore, now the, now the executive branch, one of the most powerful men in the world, has intervened to pardon Sheriff Arpaio for the things that he's done. So this needs to stop. And I would just say to, to your viewers and listeners that at freespeechforpeople.org, you can download the letter we issued to the Justice Department, and you can take action, too, because your elected officials need to hear about this. They need to understand your concerns and your views as to why this pardon power has been abused here and why the president must be held accountable for his trampling of the Constitution. Right, and one way to check pardon power is not only through the courts, it's through public opinion. If politicians suffer, presidents suffer politically, from the use of it, that's, that's a check in itself and that's within the power of the people.